Kim Zetter. Uh, she's a journalist from famous uh, uh, world known and uh, organizations and uh, long time wired journalist. The rest, Kim Zetter will be able uh, to tell about her in her own words. Kim Zetter, please. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm really happy to be here in Ukraine. It's my first time in Kiev. Um, I'm going to just jump right in because I have a fully packed presentation. Um, just everyone knows what Stuxnet is, right? Is there anyone that doesn't know Stuxnet? Okay. Um, I tend to talk really fast, so what I want you to do is I notice that a lot of you are not using translation, so if I'm talking too fast, raise your hand or shout out at me and I'll slow down. Um, I'm going to, like I said, I'm just going to jump right in because I've got a lot of material to cover here. Um, this is just the book uh, for further information after the talk or whatever if you guys are interested in getting more information. Uh, the book is only in English, uh, apparently, but it's actually being translated into Polish if anyone speaks Polish. Um, okay, so Stuxnet, I'm gonna, uh, we have to go back to 2000 to understand the context of Stuxnet. This was uh, when um, Iran broke ground on a facility outside of a village called Natanz, about 200 miles south of Tehran. Um, this was an illicit program that was being developed, but the CIA and other intelligence agencies were monitoring the situation because they had infiltrated the supply network uh, for Iran's illicit nuclear program. And in... There we go, sorry. Okay, uh, then we jump ahead two years later, September 2002, there was a press conference held in Washington, D.C. by an Iranian uh, dissident group. And they revealed for the first time publicly that Iran had this illicit nuclear program. And they described two facilities where the activities were taking place, and one of them was this uh, compound outside of Natanz. Um, and th what they were saying was that they actually got the description of what this facility was wrong, of what this facility was wrong. Initially, they said it was a fuel manufacturing plant. Um, it turned out to be a uranium enrichment plant. So if you see in the upper right-hand corner, uh, there are two square buildings. Um, those were the enrichment plants uh, that were being built about 50 feet underground. You see the brown and the gray. This was alternating layers of dirt and cement that Iran was building on top of the buildings to uh, uh, help withstand a potential airstrike against them. So this press conference was held in September 2002. And um, the, uh, there was a group of uh, nuclear non-proliferation group called ISIS, the good ISIS. Um, they're based in the US and they decided to go see if based on the location information that the Iranian dissident group provided, if they could actually find this facility uh, using satellite images. And so they found this image uh, in an archive. And the timing of the disclosure of Natanz was very strategic because a couple of months later it would have looked like this from the air. So uh, what they were able to do then is show this image on CNN so that the public knew what was going on. And what that allowed uh, to happen was the International Atomic Energy Agency, which oversees nuclear programs around the world, uh, once this went public, the IAEA was able to demand access to this facility from Iran uh, and demand answers about what exactly this program uh, was involving. So, in February 2003, IAEA, IAEA inspectors were given access to the Natanz facility for the first time, and what they discovered alarmed them because it turned out that the program was much further along than they anticipated. And so they, uh, the West put a lot of pressure on Iran to put a halt to the program until the IAEA, IAEA inspectors could get for more information about when the program began and uh, how far along Iran was in it. Um, they were concerned that Iran might have already enriched uranium ex uh, hexafluoride gas. And so they were demanding uh, documents and a lot of information. In the meantime, Iran agreed to a suspension uh, in 2003 and 2004. They agreed to halt all activity. And they started this process, this slow dance with IAEA IAE inspectors demanding information from Iran. Iran refused to give some information. Um, 
And then something changed in 2005. In May 2005, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad was elected president of Iran, and that's when Iran decided that they were going to uh, pull out of the suspension agreement and proceed with their program. So what we see then is in September 2006, Iran announces to the world, uh, we've had it with the suspension agreement. We're not going to delay this any longer. We don't care about the rest of you, what you say. We're moving forward with our enrichment process. So we see in February 2006, Iran announces that it is enriching its first batch of uranium hexafluoride gas in the pilot plant at Natanz. So those two square buildings that I showed you, let's go back to this a second, uh, in between those is a small pilot plant where Iran would test the centrifuges and the enrichment process. And once they had mastered that process, they would then begin installing the centrifuges in those underground halls. Now when those halls were fully equipped, they would hold 50,000 centrifuges total. Iran only ever got centrifuges into Hall A, and that's the one that we're going to be focusing on today. So, Iran begins to, to uh, enrich the first batch of uranium hexafluoride gas in the pilot plant. And what we see then is the first evidence of uh, sabotage occurred. This wasn't Stuxnet, but what happened, we didn't find out until a year later. There was an Iranian official who was speaking on television in an interview, and he described what happened. They had installed about 50 centrifuges in uh, the pilot plant, and for about 10 days the centrifuges operated normally, and then suddenly they started spinning out of control. And it took Iran some time to figure out what had happened, but someone had sabotaged the UPSs that Iran had uh, purchased from Turkey, and it uh, caused the centrifuges to spin too fast. So uh, Iran then figured out the problems, they reconvened, reorganized, and in February 2007, a year later, they announced that they had mastered the enrichment process and they were going to begin installing the first centrifuges in one of those underground halls. So panic now is happening in Israel and the US. Um, and then we see here, a, and let's just jump a, a year later, in April 2008, uh, so Iran begins installing the first centrifuges in February 2007. By June that year, they already have 1,400 installed in that hall. And jump ahead a year later, April 2008, and they now have uh, 3,000 centrifuges installed. So Israel is in total panic mode now, and it's come to the U.S. and it's asking for permission to launch an airstrike to uh, destroy the Natanz facility and also wants uh, uh, planes for it. And the U.S. denies them. Oops. Sorry about that. Um, so we jump ahead then. Uh, nothing is happening apparently. There's certainly no airstrike. And we jump ahead another year, November 2009, uh, and Iran now has 8,700 centrifuges installed in that first hall. And then something starts to happen. A month later, in December 2009, IAE inspectors who are visiting Natanz on average about twice a month, they start to notice something strange is occurring. They start to notice that the Iranian technicians are removing centrifuges from the hall and replacing them. And they can't figure out why they're being removed. Uh, they don't see any sort of physical damage on the outside of them. And they can't ask what's happening because the mandate for IAE inspectors is only to monitor the uranium hexafluoride gas, not to monitor the equipment. So they don't know what's going on, but they're sending reports back to the headquarters in Vienna saying something is strange. Iran keeps uh, removing centrifuges and they're removing between 1,000 and 2,000. Now, the centrifuges in Iran, uh, they're not built very well. The time, that, the kind that they were using, it was a plan that was stolen from Europe by uh, Pakistan and then sold to Iran, and it had some problems with it, had some material defects. So it would have been completely ordinary for Iran to decommission about 800, uh, about 10% of its centrifuges in a year. So if there were 8,700 centrifuges installed, it would have made perfect sense for Iran to decommission, uh, remove about 800 and replace 800 centrifuges in a year. But the IA inspectors noticed that Iran was replacing between 1,000 and 2,000 centrifuges in just two months. So clearly something was happening. And the first sign that we have, uh, that we start to learn what was happening, not completely, but this was the first clue. In June 2010, a small antivirus firm in Belarus called Virus Block Ada is contacted some customers of their in it, theirs in Iran. And the customers are complaining that they have some Windows machines that are caught in a reboot loop. And they've tried to wipe the system clean and reinstall the operating system, but they're still having a problem. So VirusBlock Ada thinks that uh, probably they have a worm somewhere on the network. 
And so they asked for uh, a permission to gain, uh, gain remote access to one of the systems, and they start examining it. And what they discover are six suspicious files. Uh, this is Sergei Olasin from Virus Blockada. He now works for Kaspersky. And Sergey and his team start to, to take apart the files, and they discover that it is using, uh, the attack is using a zero day um, that is uh, attacking a vulnerability um, in the LNK function of Windows. Um, and this is a, a really ubiquitous vulnerability that affects seven different versions of the Windows operating system going all the way back to Windows 2000. So uh, it's, the way it's spreading is USB stick, there's a malformed uh, LNK file on the USB stick. You put the uh, stick into the computer, it reads the malformed LNK file and then drops these uh, other files onto the system. So uh, Sergey Ulasin and his team didn't have a lot of experience reverse engineering malware, and the malware was encrypted. So what they did was they made the files available to the rest of the security community around the world, and in the meantime, they also told Microsoft about this zero day so that Microsoft could begin to develop a patch for it. So he made the system, the files available to everyone else, and Symantec stepped in then. Uh, this is Liam Omerku, who works in the California office. He's an Irishman, works in the California office for Symantec. Uh, Eric Chin, who's also in the California office. And Nico Fallier, who's a master reverse engineer, uh, was working at that time in the Paris office. So they began to reverse engineer this code. Uh, it was over a megabyte in size. Uh, it took them four months to reverse engineer all of it. Parts of it was written in a code that they'd never seen before, uh, a code that's a, a, a distinctive only for industrial control systems. And what they discovered that what they had on their hands was not an espionage tool, because this is what everyone thought initially, that this was espionage. Uh, they discovered quite quickly that this was a sabotage tool. But they didn't know exactly what it was designed to sabotage. Um, and so basically this was a digital weapon. And like a conventional weapon, a digital weapon has two parts, the missile and the payload. The missile, of course, is the guidance or the delivery system that gets the, the, uh, the malware onto the system. In this case, Stuxnet had seven different ways of spreading. So this was the missile portion. I mentioned it had an LMK exploit zero day. Actually, Stuxnet used five zero days over the course of its life that we know of. And that was the first sign to that this was a nation state attack and it wasn't a criminal or an espionage. Um, so those are the four, uh, I don't have the fifth one in there, it was discovered later, um, but those are the four main ones that we saw. Stuxnet also spread via network shares and it spread via, I'll jump to the bottom one, hard-coded Siemens database password. So Stuxnet got on a machine and it was immediately looking for uh, the presence of a Siemens industrial control system. And the Siemens industrial system control system uh, used a database uh, where the programming files were stored and Stuxnet used a hard-coded password that Siemens had put into that database in order to gain access to the database, infect the programming files in the database and that way when any engineer accessed the database they would get infected as well. But one of the more important ways that Stuxnet spread was through the Siemens Step 7 project files. So Siemens Step 7 is an industrial control system and the project files are used to program uh, what's called a programmable logic controller, PLC. So those are the seven ways that that version of Stuxnet was using to spread. So Siemens, uh, sorry, Stuxnet would uh, um, infect any machine, but it would only unleash its payload on a very specific configuration. And what the researchers uh, realized was that Stuxnet actually didn't have one payload, it had two payloads. But I need to clarify that. Um, there were two versions of Stuxnet that the researchers uh, analyzed. The very first version we now know is Stuxnet 1.0, and that's the version that was discovered in uh, June 2010. But it was later that they, they realized that that actually wasn't the first version of Stuxnet. And it was a couple of years later, uh, Symantec discovered an early version of Stuxnet in its archive, and that was Stuxnet 0.5. So when the researchers first discovered Stuxnet, that's the version that had two payloads in it. It had one attack code that was targeting a Siemens Step 7 315 programmable logic controller, and a second attack payload that was targeting the 417 PLC. But the 417 PLC attack code was incomplete, so the researchers were not able to reverse engineer it and figure out what it was doing. All they knew was what it was doing to the 315 PLC. Then later, when the early version of Stuxnet was discovered, that one had only one payload, and that payload targeted only the 417 PLC. 
So that's when they were actually able then to reverse engineer the 417 and discover what that was doing. But if you look at this, the, uh, the time sequence here, what we can see from this is that the attacker started uh, their attack focused only on the S7417 PLC. And then later on, when they unleashed the second version in June 2009, they changed their tactics and started focusing on this 315 PLC, and they disabled the 417. So what do those two attacks do? Um, actually, I, I should have had this slide previously. I said that uh, Stuxnet would only unleash its payload on a very specific configuration. Again, Stuxnet would infect any Windows system, going back to Windows 2000s, going back to Windows 2000. Um, but it wouldn't unleash its payload unless it found a very specific configuration. So the first thing it would do would be, it would look for a Step 7 software. Um, the Step 7 software is used to program the PLCs, the 315 and 417 PLC. Am I talking too fast? A little? Okay. Um, and the WinCC control software is monitoring software that's used to monitor the activity on the PLC and feedback um, and data to the operators. So Siemens, uh, Stuxnet would also though look for the presence of this 315 or 417 PLCs. Now it wasn't just looking for one or two PLCs, it was looking for a very specific number of each PLC and a very specific uh, configuration. So it was a precision weapon, it was not going to destroy anything else except the target that it was aimed at, um, with the aim that it wouldn't uh, cause collateral damage. Uh, this is a Siemens PLC. So, uh, what did those two versions of Stuxnet do? 0 0.5 launched 2007. We know 2007 because the first version was uploaded to Virus Total. November 2007, a sample got uploaded. So we know it was in the wild at least November 2007. And if you remember my timeline, uh, Iran started installing the first centrifuges in that underground hall in February 2007. So what did this version of Stuxnet do? It targets the 417 PLC, and the 417 PLC controls the valves on the centrifuge. So if you look at that silver thing in the corner there, and the pipes coming out the top, the way that the uh, enrichment process works is that gas is poured in through one of those pipes into the centrifuge, and then it's, uh, there's a rotor inside that spins at supersonic speed that separates the isotopes that are needed for nuclear fission from the isotopes that aren't needed. The enriched uranium with the isotopes then gets pumped out of one of those other pipes, and the depleted uranium goes out through one of the third ones. And so the valves at the top of the pipe, these are what 417 PLC controlled. And what Stuxnet did was it, it closed some of those exit valves. And some of those were already chosen, they were hard-coded into the attack, but some of them Stuxnet chose randomly on the fly. And this is what would happen. So Stuxnet would get onto that 417 PLC and it would sit there for 30 days silently recording the normal operations of that PLC and the valves. And it would store that information, it wouldn't do anything with it immediately. And at the end of that 30 days, that's when the sabotage began. So Stuxnet would start to close those exit valves, and that, that meant is that gas would pour into those centrifuges, but it wouldn't get out. Just pour in and pour in and pour in. The Stuxnet would wait for about two hours or until the pressure inside the centrifuges increased what was five times normal pressure. And during that period, that two hour period that it was conducting the sabotage, it would take that data that it had recorded during the initial 30 days, and now it would feed that false data back to the operators. So they would see that the, all the valves are open, the pressure of the centrifuges is normal, everything is fine, and Stuxnet would also disable the safety mechanism. So the centrifuges are uh, organized in a cascade. There were 164 centrifuges connected in, in each cascade, uh, connected by pipes. And there's a safety mechanism that's designed to detect if the centrifuges are getting into an unsafe condition. Let's say they're starting to spin out of control, or they're overheating, or if they're speeding, and it would automatically shut down and isolate those centrifuges. But Stuxnet disabled that safety mechanism. So the operators are seeing normal activity, and the actual safety mechanism is uh, completely incapacitated, and so can't do anything. So at the end of that two hours, uh, Stuxnet repeats. It goes back into that cycle of 30 days, silently sitting there and uh, storing normal operations, and then it would begin the sabotage again. What that tells us is that the attackers were not at looking for one-time catastrophic damage, but they were looking for incremental, looking to do incremental damage over time, which is much harder to detect, right? If you've got all of your centrifuges going wildly out of control or having problems at once, that's a clear sign that there's something going on and possibly an attack. But this was, uh, you know, incremental damage over time, and what happens when you increase the pressure inside the centrifuges? So, 
When that pressure inside the centrifuge is increased five times what's normal, what happens is that gas starts to solidify. And when the gas solidifies, it catches on that rotor that's spinning at supersonic speed inside the centrifuge, and it will hit the inside wall of the centrifuge. And it'll cause the centrifuge to teeter off balance. So the centrifuges are balanced precariously on a pin, and they're spinning at supersonic speed, so that you can see that if, if anything gets out of balance here, it's going to become unmoored and possibly crash into centrifuges next to it. So what is the goal here? The goal is to destroy centrifuges and also to waste gas. Iran had both a limited supply of materials that it could use to create new centrifuges, and it also had a limited supply of uranium hexafluoride gas that it had purchased illicitly from Iran in 2000. The point here was to buy time for sanctions and diplomacy to work. So, uh, what is the evidence of the effect? We see the actual evidence in the reports that the IAEA inspector sent back to Vienna uh, twice a month. The first centrifuges were installed in February 2007, and Iran had said that it would have 3,000 installed by May, but that didn't happen. Stuxnet was introduced around uh, mid, mid to, to end of 2007. So by August, only 1,900 are installed, and it took until no November for Iran to install the rest. We see the, the IA inspectors reporting back. Uh, there's something going on. They're not installing them as quickly as they're intending. Uh, we don't really know what's happening. Also, based on the amount of uranium hexafluoride gas that was pumped into the centrifuges, Iran should have had 124 kilogram, kilograms of enriched uranium by the end of the year, and they only had 75. So they were wasting gas, losing gas. So something happened. We had an election in the US in November 2008, and we had a changing of the guard. In January 2009, uh, President Bush, the outgoing president, met with the incoming Obama and described this uh, program, uh, which we now know was called Olympic Games, and encouraged and urged Obama to reauthorize it. Stuxnet was a covert operation, and covert operations have to be authorized by a sitting president. The sitting president is leaving. It has to be reauthorized by the incoming president. So he urges Obama. He tells him that this, this, it's having an effect, a good effect. Please reauthorize it. Obama does reauthorize it, and not only does it get reauthorized, it becomes more aggressive. So we see then the next version of Stuxnet is re released a few months into Obama's uh, um, office. Uh, in June 2009, that's when Stuxnet 1.0 is released. This version will get released two more times, in March and April 2010. The spreading mechanisms will change, the payload will remain exactly the same in both cases. Um, so, what did this one do? This one, this one targeted the 315 PLC. They're no longer looking at the valves. Um, this 315 PLC controls the frequency converters that are controlling the, um, the frequency going to the centrifuges for the spinning. And what this one did, very similar to the previous one, uh, this time it would sit on that 315 PLC for 13 days, recording normal operations and storing it. And then when the sabotage kicked in, instead of closing the, centrif closing the valves, it would increase the frequency of the centrifuges. So 1064 was about the normal operation, and it would increase from 1064 to 1410 hertz for just about 15 minutes. But 1410 hertz is just about the, the, the maximum that these centrifuges can withstand before they start to deteriorate. And then it would stop, and it would re reduce to 1064 the normal, and it would wait 26 days, again, recording normal operations before the second to half of the sabotage kicked in. And this time, instead of increasing the frequency, it would reduce it to just 2 hertz for 50 minutes. And it would do this, again, cyclically, and during the sabotage, it would feed normal operations, or sorry, it would feed false data back to the operators and disable the safety mechanism. And again, repeat, repeat, repeat. So what happens when you're um, spinning the centrifuges up and slowing them down and spinning them up and slowing them down? Uh, what happens is that this, and when you're speeding up, the centrifuges can spin out of control, but also the, the speeding up and slowing down and speeding up and slowing down starts to wear at the rotors, and it also affects the uh, level of enriched gas you get. So in order to enrich gas for, uh, for nuclear fission, you have to be spinning the centrifuges at a uniform speed for a lengthy period of time. And if you increase and slow down and increase and slow down, those isotopes that have been separated now become more, uh, what's the word? Um, someone help me with my English. Um, they start to disperse again. Um, and so uh, Iran was expecting to get between 3 and 5% of enrichment uh, in this enrichment process, and what they were actually getting was about 1.5 to 
So, uh, what we also see is the effects here. Again, it's coming in the IAEA reports. Um, June 2009, Iran had, this is a module A26, so Iran in that underground hall would, would build about uh, 3,000 centrifuges and then wall them off into a module, module A24, 26, and 28. So 3,000 centrifuges in a module. And uh, they had 12 cascades in June 2009 that were spinning and had gas in them, and six more vac were under vacuum but not yet enriching. So the process is you install the centrifuge, you put them under vacuum to take out any dust that's in them, and then once that's clean, then you introduce the gas. Um, so that's 12 that were already spinning and enriching, and six that were um, spinning and under vacuum waiting to receive gas, but then we see what happens. June 2009 is when Stuxnet hits, and in August 2009, they've taken two cascades offline. We've gone down from 12 that are spinning and enrich enriching down to only 10 that are enriching. Uh, but we have eight now that are under, under in vacuum. So what they've done is they've taken two cascades of centrifuges, they've removed the gas from them, but they're still spinning, they've got them under vacuum. And then we see a few months later, now they're down to six cascades that are enriching gas. So they've got the, they've got the centrifuges sitting there on the cascades, they're trying to figure out what's happening, they've removed the gas, from half of them, but they're keeping them spinning, uh, optimistic that they're going to figure this out, and they don't. And so what do we see the next month? They just start removing centrifuges because they can't figure out what's going on. So sabotage at a glance. Uh, if you could look at this chart, it shows sort of the number of centrifuges that are installed and the activity, and you'll see that the centrifuges, they, they keep installing centrifuges, but you'll see that the, the, the activity of the actual enrichment process is staying the same and dropping. So the Iranians were stumped. They couldn't figure out what was going on. Uh, one of the ways that Stuxnet hid was if the engineers or the programmers uh, decided to, uh, if they thought that, okay, maybe the centrifuges aren't the problem, maybe the, the code on the PLC is the problem. If they decided to examine the code on the PLC, Stuxnet was looking for that. It was looking for any read commands. And what it would do is as the blocks were coming from the PLC, Stuxnet would intercept them and scrub clean any of the malicious code and serve up clean blocks of code to the engineers. So if the engineers decided, okay, I'm looking at the code, there doesn't seem to be a problem here, let's just start over from scratch. Let's wipe clean the PLCs and uh, reprogram them. Stuxnet was looking for that as well. Any new code blocks that came in, Stuxnet would intercept them and inject its malicious code into those code blocks. That's how they maintain persistence on the PLC. So how did Stuxnet get caught? I mentioned that there were three waves of that one version of Stuxnet. It was uh, June 2009, and then it was reintroduced in March and April 2010. Um, we know that those three waves of attack didn't uh, start at Natanz. It started uh, at five companies outside of Natanz, five contracting companies. Uh, Symantec never identified them by name. They called them only domain A, B, C, D, E, and E. And we see in the June 2009 attack, they hit uh, company A, B, C, and D. In the second wave that hit in March 2010, this is the version that gets Stuxnet caught. Uh, it only goes after company B. And in the third version, the next month in April, it goes after A, company A, company E, and company B. Company B is the only company that got hit in all three waves. Who are these companies? So we know that company A is Fulad Technique. Company B is Bay Paju. Uh, th the third one, C, is Nita Industrial Group. D is a company that we believe is CGJ, uh, Control Go Starge Ahead, and company E is Kala Electric or Kalai. So all of these companies are contractors that are involved in the business of installing industrial control systems, and we know that a couple of them were specifically involved in installing industrial control systems at Natanz. Um, Kala Electric uh, was a watch factory in Tehran that was converted into a secret centrifuge factory in 2000, and then under another name, Kalai Electric, it became a front company uh, to procure um, illicit equipment for the program. So how do we know the names of these companies? The first version of Stuxnet, 0 0.5, that was unleashed in 2007, only had one way of spreading. It had to spread via a Step 7 project file on a USB stick. In March 2010, however, the attackers added spreading mechanisms. Uh, it could spread via a USB stick, but it had all those other spreading mechanisms that I showed you at the beginning of the, the talk. Um, they also added something else. They added a log file to Stuxnet. 
and that log file would uh, report back to the command and control server anytime Stuxnet infected a Windows machine, and it would send certain information. It would send uh, the external and the internal, internal IP addresses. It would send the uh, time and date stamp of the infection. It would send the name on the computer and the group name, and it would also send the name of the domain, and quite often the domain was the name of the company. But it also sent back information about whether or not that computer had that coveted Siemens software on it. Did it have the Step 7 software or the PLC? And you'll see in the lower right-hand corner there, at Bay Paju, they struck gold. You'll see the Siemens Step 7 and the PLC there. So what's happening here? The first version of Stuxnet had one way of spreading, like I said, on a USB stick. What that tells us is that the attackers had close access to the target systems. They either had uh, a, a a uh, mole that was helping them get it on there, or they had some kind of unwitting help from a contractor who carried Stuxnet on the USB stick. Something happened in 2009, they lost that close access. And now they had to find a different way to get that second version of Stuxnet in. So they started by infecting these contractors uh, with the hope that they would carry Stuxnet in. The problem was they added this log file so that they could monitor, Stuxnet was a worm, so that they could monitor each system that Stuxnet is infecting and so they can tell when Stuxnet is reaching, getting close to reaching its target. But of course the researchers were able to reverse engineer that log file and trace it back to the patient zeros of where the, the uh, attack began. So, I mentioned that Stuxnet, the March 2010 version is the one that got Stuxnet caught. That's the version that they only attacked Bay Paju, and it had all these seven spreading mechanisms. Bay Paju's headquarters is in Iran, but it also has offices in Malaysia and London. And what happened is that these contractors then infected their own network and started spreading it out to all of their clients every time they went out to another network. So, said that that version of Stuxnet is reporting into a command and control server every time it's infecting its machine. The attackers would have seen Stuxnet reporting in from Australia, from the US, from London, from around the world. They would have known immediately that Stuxnet had spread beyond control. And this is, this is just a snapshot uh, the first couple of months after Stuxnet, 100,000 plus machines. Um, last time I, stuck, I was at a conference where Kaspersky gave a talk about three years ago um, and they said that they had counted to more than 3 million machines. Stuxnet is a worm, and it continues to spread like Configur as long as it finds another vulnerable machine on a network. So, um, oh, that's not supposed to be there. So, um, PLCs. I'm just going to switch gears a little here, and uh, now we talk about beyond Stuxnet here, the aftermath. So the PLCs that Stuxnet targeted are not secure. They've never, never been built with security in mind. Um, but PLCs, SCADA systems, and remote terminal units are the backbone of all critical infrastructure around the world. They are on, in power plants, in water sewage treatment plants, water reservoirs, gas pipelines, car assembly lines, chemical and pharmaceutical plants, food and beverage plants. They control the temperature at which the food is pasteurized. Um, elevators, heat and air conditioning. Um, I've got uh, the Ukraine power grid hack here on the right hand corner. Um, that attack targeted the RTUs, uh, wiped them clean in the field so that the operators, when they took out, when the attackers took out power, the operators couldn't send uh, remote commands out to the RTUs because they were bricked in order to bring back that power. Um, so, the, they also control prison, uh, high, high security prison cells. Uh, furnaces uh, where glass, fiberglass, and steel are made for skyscrapers, cars, airplanes. They control traffic lights, they raise and lower bridges, and they control uh, commuter and freight trains. The prison thing, let me just stop at that for a second. Um, do you guys get Mr. Robot here? So I don't know if you remember the episode of Mr. Robot where Elliot broke the drug dealer out of a prison by attacking the PLC. Um, that's based on actual research that was done by, it was presented at DEF CON a few years earlier. Um, PLCs, four prisons were found accessible over the internet, and, and you could indeed open prison doors. So we had a case where a glitch um, in a U.S. prison where all the doors suddenly opened one day, and rival gang members then poured into the hallways and started fighting with each other. So it's unclear whether that was a, a planned by an outsider so that one gang could go after another or what. So um, I just want to talk uh, just briefly about possibilities here. If the systems are um, if the systems are, uh, if these systems are controlling critical infrastructure, what are the potentials here? So I'm going to just show you a couple of incidences that have happened uh, in the U.S. 
these, none of these were caused by a malicious actor, but what happens, of course, is the malicious actors will study accidents and uh, to uncover vulnerabilities that they can use to cause the same uh, results with an intentional attack. So, and this is outside of Washington, D.C., a metro crash in June 2009, killed nine people and injured 80 others. The problem here was faulty sensors on the track. Uh, sensors on the track are supposed to detect when one train is stopped so that other trains coming into a station will know that there's a stopped train and, and, and will, will halt. In this case, the sensors weren't working, and the trains themselves also have sensors so that they can sense when a, a train is in front of them. The sensors on the train weren't working, and also when the operator tried to manually engage the brake, it didn't work. So, perfect storm here. Um, I've never seen a report that explained exactly what happened here, although the DC metro system had had problems with its sensors in the past. Uh, but again, control systems on trains uh, can be accessible uh, through things like the ticket, ticketing systems um, and um, the system that controls the digital displays at the, at the, um, the train stations. San Bruno pipeline explosion in 2010, this was in California, killed eight people, destroyed 38 homes. In this case, uh, it was a maintenance worker who had uh, disabled, he was, he was doing some work on uh, the network, it was a little unclear what he, he was doing, but he cut the power to the network and that cut the power to the PLC. And without power to the PLC, the operators couldn't see what was going on on the pipeline. Uh, when you cut power to the PLC, the system was designed to fail open, so the valves fail open instead of closing, so that the customers could continue to get gas even if the, there's a power outage. The problem with that was, as the gas kept pouring into the pipeline, the pipeline was 20 years old, and it had already been uh, damaged by a backhoe. And so all of this gas is pouring in, like the centrifuges, the pressure increases, and then uh, there was an explosion. And the operators never saw it coming. They never saw the, the power, uh, the pressure increasing. Similar incident with the Olympic Pipeline Company in Bellingham, Washington in 1999. Uh, there was a leak that was pouring gasoline into a nearby waterway. Uh, 237,000 gallons of gasoline poured into the waterway. And customers are calling in to the pipeline company saying that they smell gas. And the pipeline company is looking at their operator stations. They don't see anything. They don't see a leak. They don't see pressure uh, changes, nothing. And then it ignited, uh, killed two 10-year-old uh, boys and a teen. Um, they did find uh, some problems there with the control system, and they also found some problems with the configuration. Um, that it, uh, there was a possibility for someone to get in outside through the business, to get in from outside through the business network. It wasn't completely uh, securely bridged the two networks. Um, so, uh, so those are uh, possibilities of you know what some someone could do if they did an intentional attack. Um, I just had a brief uh, slide there about the Ukraine power grid hack. Um, the Ukraine power grid hack twice in 2015-2016, you all know, it was short-lived, right? It was maybe between one hour in the 2016 uh, operation and then the 2015 operation power was out for between three to six hours for most of the customers uh, and then it was restored. Um, not a really extensive attack. But you could actually increase the, the consequences of that if you can cause physical damage in the way that Stuxnet caused physical damage. So how would you do that? There was a group of researchers at Idaho National Lab in the U.S. that in March 2007 uh, decided to uh, test a hypothesis that they had. They wanted to see if you could cause physical destruction, if hackers in North Korea or China or Russia could cause physical destruction of equipment on the U.S. grid using nothing more than malicious code. And the result was this thing that they call the Aurora Generator Test. Does anyone know about the Aurora Generator Test? Um, okay, so this test, uh, what they did was they decided to attack the safety mechanism. So the way that the grid works in the U.S., everything on the grid is operating at 60 hertz. And that means that any equipment attached to it, like a generator, has to be operating at that same frequency. Otherwise, uh, there's a safety mechanism, the protective relay, that will uh, instruct the breakers to open and disconnect that equipment from the grid in order to protect it. So, what the attackers in this case decided to do, the researchers, they decided to subvert the safety mechanism and use that as the attack vector. They decided to trick the safety mechanism, the protective relay, into thinking that an unsafe condition, an out of sync condition, was actually an okay condition. So if the generator was out of sync, was, was higher than 60, uh, 60 hertz, it was okay to reconnect that to the grid. 
So that's the first thing that they did to trick the protective relay. Second thing they did was they designed a cyclical attack like Stuxnet. They told the, the protective relay to open the breaker and close, and open and close, and open and close. So what happens? The generator is connected to the grid, and the grid is uh, pushing back on the generator. But you open that breaker, and the generator is disconnected from the grid, and there's nothing pushing back to keep that generator at the same uh, frequency. So the generator will start to speed up, and then you close that breaker, and the generator is now going higher at a higher frequency than the uh, the grid. And you open it, and the, the generator speeds up, and you close it, and you open it, and you close it. So what happens when you close that grid, when you close the breakers, and you reconnect that generator, the generator is producing too much energy for the slower grid. And that energy has nowhere to go, the excess energy. So what happens is that it hits the slower grid, and it bounces back and hits uh, the generator. And this is what happens. That's the energy coming back at the generator. Generator. So that attack took just three minutes to kill the generator, 27-ton generator. It could have, they could have accomplished it in just 15 seconds, but they built some pauses into the attack so that the safety engineers could check it every time uh, after every sequence. So there was a report that came out in around 2009 in the U.S. Um, that determined that there were about seven, uh, sorry, nine critical substations around the U.S that if attackers were able to take out the generators for a lengthy period of time, like causing physical destruction, you could cause a nationwide blackout for potentially months. Um, these generators are custom built, and this 27-ton generator is actually a small one. It's not even the size of the ones that are um, operating on the grid. Those generators are custom built, and it can take a year to replace them. So that's what the U.S. is looking at now, um, also in light of the Ukraine hack, um, where we see actual proof of concept attacks in the field. Uh, and that's what we're fearing going forward, that something like that will occur in the U.S. Um, so that's the end of my talk. Uh, if you have questions, I'm here all day, um, and there's my email and my Twitter account.